So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Neha Mahindra. I will be presenting some key concepts from the fifth chapter of the IPCC Working Group One report, uh, the fifth assessment report. I'm currently a student at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, uh, and I'm in my first year of master's in climate physics. So from the ancient Greek literature to the works of Joseph Fourier, who discovered the greenhouse effect in the 18th century, uh, the Earth's climate has been studied for quite a long time. Figuring out the climate is like putting together pieces of a puzzle. It's incredible how much collaboration there is in the field of climate research. At EMAO, where I will be doing my master's thesis next year, there are five main research groups, ice and climate, atmospheric dynamics, ocean and climate, atmospheric physics and chemistry, and coastal and, sea sh and shelf sea dynamics. All of this is just the physics of the climate. For a full view, different parts of the science, different parts of science have to be integrated. For example, in sediment cores, biology of individual organisms like foraminifera, chemistry of their shell composition, and physics of ocean circulation, all has to be combined to form a coherent picture. This is a huge task which requires intense collaboration. So the mere existence of this report is actually quite, quite incredible. For those of you who are a bit unclear about the IPCC, let me give you a quick overview of what it is. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. The IPCC reports are divided into three working group reports. Working group one deals with the physical science basis of climate change. Working group two with climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability and working group three with mitigation of climate change. Today, we will only be looking at the working group one report. To put some numbers on the collaboration effort, let me tell you about the latest report. Uh, there were 259 authors who are all experts in their field who contributed. After the first draft, it was opened up for comments and there were 54,677 comments all of which were individually addressed by 1089 experts. I really hope this gives you an idea about why there is almost unanimous scientific agreement on the topic of anthropogenic climate change. I definitely encourage all of you to try and read a part of this report. You can access it in full, including downloadable figures and texts without any paywalls or author's permissions for personal reading on ipcc.ch. So let's, let's get into the fifth chapter from the fifth assessment report of working group one. Uh, it's titled information from paleoclimate archives. The term paleoclimate uh, means climate of the past. And we care about this paleoclimate because understanding it can help us gauge the natural variability of the Earth's climate. And so also the extent to which these changes can be attributed to human activity or not. In the modern times, we can use instrumental records to measure different variables. For example, on, on the left, you see observations from the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, which keeps a track of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere uh, in parts per million. But for most of Earth's history, there were no scientists around to observe or record the climate. So how do we figure out past climates? Well, we use proxies. A climate proxy is a preserved record of the past that is used to infer some aspect of the past climate, such as temperature or CO2 levels. Some commonly used proxies are tree rings, ice cores, fossils, and ocean sediment cores. Um, here you can see uh, a picture of uh, the foraminifera that I was talking about earlier uh, when I talked about sediment cores. In 1955, um, an Italian paleontologist named Cesar Emiliani first used oxygen isotopes in foraminifera to establish past ocean temperatures. 
Now, oxygen has two different isotopes, O16 and O18. This means that they have different number of neutrons. He realized that when water is evaporating from the ocean, we can kind of roughly picture that the lighter O16 would evaporate first and the ocean would become enriched in O18. So we would see a fractionation effect. In a warmer climate, the ocean would be less enriched in O18. And in a colder climate, it would be more enriched in O18. Now imagine that these, the plankton are taking up this oxygen and they're carrying the signal of fractionation into sediments, which can be analyzed. So um, here we can see that there's a plot of uh, isotope ratios in a sediment core. Uh, I look at the purple line and the green line. On the y-axis, there is delta O18, which is the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 isotopes. So in warmer climates, delta O18 is lower. And in colder climates, delta O18 is higher. So this, this axis has been flipped. So 3.5 is corresponding to a higher um, temperature. This can be independently verified by a lot of uh, other proxy data, for example, by using uh, fossil leaves to estab establish temperatures. Uh, Jane Francis, who is the director of the British Antarctic Survey, uh, is producing active research in this field if you want to look it up. Now, speaking of leaves, we can even go back beyond the time span covered by ice core data by using stomatal evidence. Stomata are present on the surface of a leaf, which plants used for breathing. Naturally, if you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, it corresponds to plants with lesser stomata, and a lower CO2 level would lead to plants with more stomata. Looking at fossils of these stomata, we can figure out atmospheric CO2 levels dating back as far as 60 million years ago. Uh, one of the most um, import, uh, well, common climate statements uh, when people talk about, you know, if they want to refute climate change, they say, oh, the climate is changing all the time. You know, that is not new that the climate is changing. The problem with that statement is that yes, as I just mentioned, the climate has always changed, but we really have to look into why and how it has changed and what we can learn from it. So this is from section 5.2.1 of the report, which looks at external forcing factors. So in this part, I'll give you a brief introduction on how celestial mechanics affect the climate. So the main reason for these changes is that the Earth's orbit is affected by the pull of gas giants Jupiter and Venus, which slightly distort the orbital pattern in a regular time frame. There are three essential parameters, parameters to look at. The first one is eccentricity. The Earth's orbit is nearly circular, but it's, uh, it's not. It's elliptical. The sun is not in the center, so it's eccentric. Right now, relatively speaking, the winters are warmer and the summers are cool because the sun is furthest away in the northern hemisphere summer, uh, as you can see. So this dashed line is currently the, well, it's a very exaggerated picture, but the dashed line is showing um, what it looks like right now. So this would be the position of the earth in northern hemisphere summer, and this would be the position of the earth in northern hemisphere winter. The shape of the orbit changes in a um, 100 kilo year period. So Ka is 100,000 years before present. Uh, and this, this modulates the amplitude of seasonality because if you have a summer here, instead of having a summer here like we have now, it would obviously be a stronger summer. The next one that we look at is obliquity, uh, which is the change in the tilt of the Earth. It's currently at 23 and a half degrees. So this means that there's medium seasonality. Uh, most differences are seen at higher latitudes and the period for this is 41,000 years. Uh, finally, we look at precession, which is actually two signals combined. But if we talk about actual precession, this picture makes it quite clear. Right now, our axis is pointed towards the pole star but it was not always like this. It used to be pointed towards Vega. 
and it rotates around like this with a period of 20k well 20000 years um yeah so here we can see the different forcing parameters combined to give a plot of the combined insulation uh, when we plot the eccentricity we can see 100 kilo year um, cycles and we can also see that this is superimposed on a 400 kilo year cycle and these patterns um, are induced by the way that planets interact uh, we can see here that if you have dips then there'll be warmer winters because the orbit will be more circular and the spikes are when uh, the orbit is more elliptical and the winters would be colder so currently we're in a, in a relatively warm period uh, and these other two parameters also show that now orbital changes explain ice ages in 21 milutin milankovitch took eccentricity obliquity and precession and combined them he wanted to see how much incoming solar radiation we would get at a particular location on the Earth's surface. Um, in this case, he was interested in 65 degrees north. Think about this. If you're around Oslo, um, if snow in the summer kept staying, it would be a glacial period. Otherwise, it would be an interglacial. Uh, there was also the time, this was also the time when um, German scientists who found glaciations uh, Gauss, Mindel, Riss, and Worm, um, and they agreed with his theory. Now, the big takeaway that I want um, you 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 guys to take from this is that our climate has always been operating between narrow natural packets of variability, um, and here we we should still be in the Little Ice Age, but our emissions have really moved and into completely uncharted climate territory. Uh, I would like to talk about glaciers for a bit now. So there were huge ice sheets which covered a lot of North America, Eurasia, and South America during the Pleistocene era. This was the last glacial period, and ice sheets reached their great greatest size about uh, 18,000 years ago. During the Pleistocene Ice Age, nearly one third of the Earth's land was The Laurentide Ice Sheet was almost three kilometers thick and covered North America from the Canadian Arctic all the way to the US state of Missouri. Uh, glacial retreat of the Laurentide, Laurentide Ice Sheet created such features as the Great Lakes that we know of now. Uh, the glaciers on Baffin Island in Canada are also remnants of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. So I want to tell you about the deglaciation of North America, which is a process that links climate change with the physical oceanic process. Around 13,000 years ago, uh, the ice sheet had noticeably reduced. We can see here uh, the lakes that are kind of ponded against the edge of the ice sheet. Uh, these were the earlier Great Lakes of North America, uh, and this had a huge um, impact because there was fresh water that was flowing from the melting ice sheet into the North Atlantic very quickly, uh, and you can imagine how that would have an impact on the ocean circulation. So I'll maybe go over how uh, that happened right now. So. This is a picture of the so-called Great Oceanic Conveyor Belt, which brings warm surface water far north in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and it warms northern or northwestern Europe before cooling down and sinking below warm surfaces, um, below the warm surface water, I mean, and it moves south as deep water. If you look at this area that's on the south of Greenland, you can see very cold surface water water being added here around 13,000 years ago because of the melting ice sheet. This would obviously have a huge effect on this oceanic conveyor belt, uh, causing it to maybe slow or even stop. The effective feedback of this would be that average temperatures at northern latitudes would drop in a very short time span. Uh, and you can see this spike actually um, in one of the previous plots that I've shown. So I want to conclude by saying that 
natural variability exists for sure but it's important to critically study all aspects of it and as i mentioned before try to find many pieces of the puzzle puzzle as possible and we don't obviously we don't have all the pieces yet but even if we don't we can still kind of see the big picture i think um and yeah i would like to leave you with this thank you for your attention are there any questions